So I'm Dr. Peasley, and I'm um, actually from Unity Point Health Grinnell Regional Medical Center, and I am the Pediatric Medical Director of our Adolescent Bariatric Surgery Program. Um, and then I also um, do both internal medicine and pediatrics, and then I'm also board certified in obesity medicine. Let's see if this is going to work today. Um, I do have a couple disclosures. One, I am a speaker for a company called Rhythm Pharmaceuticals. And then you are going to see a couple of slides throughout this presentation that are pulled from the pediatric algorithm from the Obesity Medicine Association. I strongly consider downloading this if you're um, going to be doing any kind of obesity treatment with children um, or adolescents. And you can download it for free at this website here. So my brief overview to kind of give a roadmap for today is first, I'd like to help you understand obesity as a chronic disease. And then we're going to look at pharmacology for obesity treatment, both an overview of medications and the role of developing obesity, as well as options when we think about pharmacologic treatment for obesity. And then we'll briefly touch on kind of roles and outcomes of adolescent bariatric surgery. And if I have time, um, I can kind of walk through a case study. And so for those of us that do obesity medicine, we, we try really hard to think about person first language when working with our patients, and part of that is treating obesity as a chronic disease. Um, we, we try to move away from using terms like your child is obese or you are obese, and instead phrases such as we're here to discuss your child's obesity today, um, and that helps us frame it when we think of it in terms of what's going on in the body. And so the current definition as used by the Obesity Society and the OMA, as well as many others, defines obesity as follows. It's a chronic, relapsing, multifactorial, neurobehavioral disease wherein an increase in body fat promotes adipose tissue dysfunction and abnormal fat mass physical forces, resulting in adverse metabolic, biomechanical, and psychosocial health consequences. And why we want to frame it in this way is because it helps us better understand what goes on in the body. Um, the other term that is kind of coming into favor and was coined by the two main um, groups of endocrinologists back in um, 2017 is to start using, um, thinking about obesity in terms of ad adiposity-based chronic disease. So what does that mean? So if we think about that definition I just showed you, we're thinking about a disease rooted in kind of a dysfunctional adipose tissue. And so it's a disease based on this tissue pathophysiology that involves abnormalities in mass in fat mass and adipo adipose tissue distribution as well as function. And then the chronic disease aspect, meaning these are lifelong disease complications that confer morbidity and mortality, including biomechanical complications, such as osteoarthritis and sleep apnea, and kind of what we're generally trying to avoid, which is our cardiometabolic disease complications, so stroke, heart disease, diabetes. And when we use this kind of framework for how we think about it, we really can see that the patho pathophysiology and natural history are consistent with opportunities for primary, secondary, and tertiary phases of chronic disease prevention. And then the last kind of piece of this is thinking about obesity as a multifactorial disease. Um, so not everybody is going to end up the same way, um, and that's largely due to a combination of genetics and then the interaction our lifestyle as well as our environment has uh, on whether or not one will actually develop the disease that is obesity. So why? Oh, I didn't go slide. Uh, I also wanted to put in kind of my two main resources that you're going to see referenced. Um, this is kind of one that I. Um, really enjoy. Uh, it's a recent article from the journal Obesity in February, um, written by several leaders in kind of pediatric obesity pharmacology as well as a few surgeons. Um, and you'll kind of see it referenced as the Srivastava article. I would encourage you to pull it if you have an interest in learning more about um, kind of the medications uh, and position statement of many experts in this field. And then the last one that's worth reading if you're interested, um, this is from the Team Labs Consortium and we'll kind of briefly go over uh, the results of this article, and this is a group of, I think, three or five centers across the country that have been now tracking uh, gastric sleeve ruin-wise, and occasionally a few lap bands um, performed in adolescence, and then looking at their longitudinal outcomes. So the last part we're going to touch on here so that you have a better understanding of kind of the, the medicines we're going to talk about today 
it's kind of, again, to me, of obesity as a neurobiologic disease. And so this is a slide um, that Dr. Apobian um, put together uh, back in 2015. Um, and here's a reference if you wanted to read the paper. But you can see that weight and appetite control are kind of a tightly regulated orchestra that combines you know, signaling from our peripheral tissue, generally through things like insulin and leptin. However, ghrelin and TTY also play a role. And then there's a significant pathway throughout our brain um, that starts kind of in our arcuate nucleus through POMC and alpha-MSH, and then kind of going up to our melanocortin-4 receptor in our periventricular nucleus. And from here, it goes off um, throughout through other signaling to kind of help us regulate our appetite control and base metabolism. And so a lot of the medicines we'll talk about today are going to actually have their action up here in the brain. And so why do we want to focus on pediatric obesity? Um, one in five youth in the United States are afflicted with obesity. And if we actually broaden it out to overweight and obesity, it, it's starting to kind of approach that one in three. And of those children, we know that 9.5% of adolescents meet criteria of severe obesity, meaning a BMI greater than the 120th percentile of the 95th percentile, or a BMI of 35, whichever is lower. And then adolescent overweight and obesity is heavily associated with deteriorating cardiometabolic health, increased cardiovascular mortality, and future disease burden into adulthood, and that that presence of childhood obesity will strongly predict diabetes mortality up to the seventh decade. A point that I'd really like to emphasize, um, if you're seeing a young child who is off the growth chart in terms of their BMI, and you know, they're four, they're five, we really want to stop trying to tell families and patients that that child's going to outgrow their obesity because the studies really show that the revision of having that severe degree of obesity in childhood and either dropping down to only moderate obesity or even all the way down to normal weight is actually extraordinarily rare. And so these children are not just going to outgrow their weight with time. Um, and we know that only about 2 to 15 percent of adolescents with severe obesity are actually going to respond to just lifestyle modification therapy and achieve a clinically significant and durable weight or BMI reduction. And so that brings us to kind of what we think of as our clinical approach to pediatric obesity. Um, and you have hopefully heard some of this on previous calls when we talk about stage 1, 2, 3, and 4. So that stage one and two being kind of your evaluation of diet, um, exercise, stress management. And when this is not necessarily sufficient, you want to start thinking about coming over to here to where we want to add on pharmacology. Again, you have two criteria, a BMI less greater than or equal to the 95th percentile with a comorbidity, or that severe degree of obesity, meaning greater than 120th of the 95th percentile, regardless of if a comorbidity is present. And you want to think about sending them on for kind of that pharmacologic directed therapy. And our biggest goal here um, is to really start to try and achieve a greater than or equal to 5% reduction in BMI from that baseline or index visit, or start to show some change in a BMI trajectory or stability over those first three months. Um, and again, we're always doing these. You can see that they always play a role back here, as well as when we start to think about coming down here to bariatric surgery. Um, because if we're not achieving meaningful weight loss here, we really want to think about is this child and family potentially a candidate for bariatric surgery? And so in general, from a weight standpoint, that surgical criteria you're going to think of, again, severe obesity, meaning greater than uh, 120th of the 95th with a comorbidity. So NASH, um, OSA, hypertension, diabetes, um, or strictly a BMI greater than 140th of the 95th percentile or a BMI greater than 40. Um, and again, I like to point this out also to, in case there's any surgeons on the phone today. When we think about bariatric surgery, you'll notice that this circle comes back around full circle, either going this way or through this way, and this is this long-term disease aspect. So we want to think about just not post-surgical complications, but we know that the younger and younger we're doing these surgeries, there's a bigger role potentially for adjuvant pharmacology to help these patients deal with kind of the lifelong disease. Okay, so we're going to kind of move into the meat of today, which is kind of some basics. So first, I really wanted to touch on obesogenic medications. Um, I know hopefully there's many that are doing some primary care here, and I really want you to maybe start thinking about medications that you are prescribing to children that could potentially be leading to an increase in their weight. Um, this is a, where you'll see kind of from the pediatric algorithm. So the references 
if you were to pull this, are all right here, and this is kind of um, our overview. So these are a wide range of common conditions that you may be seeing children um, with. And if you're seeing children and they're on these medications and you're seeing a significant BMI curve, if you're the prescribing provider, you may want to think about potentially a transition down to the other two categories if appropriate, or having a conversation with the prescribing practitioner um, on if it's appropriate to consider medications down here in the neutral to mild category. I want to specifically touch on more of our psychiatric medications, and we'll um, go over that in a minute. But as you can see, we are seeing more and more children on a combination of antidepressants, antipsychotics, and mood stabilizers. And these, in particular, are associated with a significant amount of weight gain. So again, if it's appropriate, um, thinking about transitioning over to one of these either smaller weight gain um, potential or potentially over to the propion or tropyramate for a weight loss effect. So why do we care about antipsychotic medications so much? Um, we are seeing them increasingly prescribed over the last 20 years in children, and up to 80% of children are showing significant weight gain, particularly with the second generation antipsychotics. The highest weight gaining potential is olanzapine, then clozapine, then risperidone, and the least kind of one in that um, category being aripiprazole. And the concern is that these children are at fairly high risk and they're getting them younger and younger, particularly those that are already at risk for some nutritional issues, sensory processing issues that can affect their food choice, and those are those kids with autism. Um, and they are starting to be exposed as young as age five or six. And with this population, the one thing I would encourage you to maybe think about doing in your own practice might be consideration of actually starting these children on metformin. And so multiple studies um, and the references, like I said here, down here, if you wanted to pull them from the pediatric algorithm, um, have demonstrated that metformin okay. is very effective in decreasing the weight gain associated with an atypical antipsychotic use, independent if this child has insulin resistance or diabetes. And then you want to think about your dosing. Um, you can titrate up to 500 milligrams twice daily for children ages 6 to 9, and uh, generally up to 850 milligrams twice daily for those 10 to 17. Overall tolerability is generally pretty um, good. Oh, sorry? Is there a question? Can we you all lines? Okay. Um, if there's a question, I'm happy to answer it at the end. Um, I'm going to kind of keep going here. Okay. Migraine is another big category that um, oftentimes children are on medications for. So there is a strong positive association with headaches and obesity among children, as well as an increased risk of migraines in children with obesity. Um, and some of the thought is there's a, an overlap in those neurotransmitters involved in both migraine pathology as well as feeding behaviors, including serotonin, orexin, adiponectin, leptin. Um, and so many of the medicines we're using for migraines, you know, our most common ones being things like amitriptyline. Um, I've seen a couple on gabapentin. I've seen a couple on di uh, or on valproic acid. These are generally heavily associated with weight gain. Um, and what we want to do is maybe think about use of topiramate. Um, topiramate, again, generally a well-tolerated migraine medication in children that is generally weight negative. Um, you can see there's kind of our recommended dosing guideline here. Um, and it's generally a pretty good choice. Um, it's been well studied in the pediatric population. We'll kind of touch base on this in terms of an obesity standpoint on a few slides. Um, but the other important part with migraine is to also think about those psychosocial and physical triggers for patients that are also part of this integrative weight management approach, including management of stress, depression, anxiety, proper nutrition, avoidance of hypoglycemia, and avoidance of dehydration. Okay. So some special considerations when you start thinking about using a pharmacology specifically for obesity in children, you really want to think of having that multidisciplinary team with you when you're starting to um, consider these meds. Uh, we already talked a little bit about the BMI criteria, which is up here for a refresher. Of note, there's no upper limit for a threshold of initiation of pharmacology. If when I see somebody, I take a pretty detailed history. I'm not going to make them do, you know, 12 weeks with me if I can get good documentation from the family or from the referring provider that a good lifestyle therapy attempt was made. That is considered sufficient proof of that prior lifestyle intervention. And oftentimes, most patients and families have already done this, and they're coming to me because they're, they're frustrated because their child 
is still either gaining weight rapidly or has not had any significant successful intervention. Um, tanner staging, uh, as far as I know, none of the main medications that we're going to talk about today have any significant evidence for risk uh, ascribed to pubertal development. That, that is a consideration you want to think about as hopefully more and more medications become available. I'm also going to screen them, you know, do you meet bariatric psych surgery criteria? And a lot of the children I see in my clinic do actually meet bariatric surgery criteria. It just may not be appropriate or possible at that particularly given time. Or I'm seeing some of my adults who've already had bariatric surgery and are coming to me now for medications as adjuvant therapy to help them continue um, dealing with their obesity. You want to continue medications if there's at least a greater than 5% BMI reduction um, when you reevaluate them at 12 weeks on the optimal dose, or in some cases if I've arrested or slowed the weight gain and that's considered a reasonable clinical outcome. Very important, who should not get pharmacology, and I would also preface who should not get bariatric surgery, are those in the setting of a severe psychiatric disturbance, a current eating disorder that is active, um, an untreated endocrinopathy, or if co-commitment use of medication could potentially result in adverse interactions. Um, additional considerations, um, one medicine in particular whoops, we'll talk about today is only FDA approved for 12 weeks, but as we kind of set the stage, you know, obesity is a chronic disease. If you take away someone's medication that's been helping them, you're going to get a rebound in their weight and disease pathology. These are lifelong treatment options in some cases, and you have to view it as a lifelong disease. It would be the same thing as taking away somebody's antihypertensive because their blood pressure became well controlled while on the medication. What's going to happen is their hypertension has that chance to significantly come back um, and have all of the other downstream complications from it. Unique to pediatrics, these medications are largely used off-label, and so, you know, the AAP statement on this is that you really need to think about documenting your therapeutic decision making, and you need to rely on the best available evidence at the time, and really think of it on that individual level and weigh the benefit risk for that patient. Likewise, um, particularly if you are watching this from a state that is not Iowa or has more um, prohibitive prescription practices, you really need to require documentation in your EMR that you obtain not just the standard informed consent from the parent, but also the assent from potentially your adolescent. And you need to document that you had that conversation with a family and patient regarding the off-label use and that they fully understand the risk, benefits, side effects, and appropriate follow-up care if we're going to be using these medications. And then lastly, you need to know your specific statutes and bylaws as they relate to your state. Um, okay, so first we're going to talk about FDA-approved uses in pediatrics, because there are two. First up is Orlistat. Um, this is actually FDA-approved in children greater than 12. This is one of the few ones that works on the gut um, alone. It's a pancreatic and gastric glycase inhibitor, meaning it prevents you from absorbing fat in your diet. Overall, weight loss is generally small in these cases. Um, I would actually say I've never prescribed this medication, mostly because the side effects preclude usage in most patients. So most of the patients I see are following a low-carb, high-fat diet. This medicine is just going to be awful for them. Um, oftentimes, it's going to give them significant flatulence and um, oily, oily diarrhea, um, which is generally not tolerable, especially if you're going to school. And then the two contraindications to using Orlistat include cholestasis or chronic malabsorption syndrome. Fentramine is actually FDA approved in children, um, and it actually carries this caveat that it's, quote, for short-term use. Um, and it's approved for children greater than 16. Um, that caveat for short-term use was defined kind of as 12 weeks, and this is actually based on very old studies and labeling from the 1950s. Yet, when we combine fentramine with topiramate and studied it in adults, it's currently approved for long-term use. And so many of us who practice obesity medicine would actually feel very comfortable keeping people on fentramine for a long period of time with close monitoring. Um, how it works, it's a sympathomimetic amine, um, it actually has pretty decent BMI reduction. On average, it's 4.1% at six months. However, there are a subset of people that tend to be hyper responders to fentramine, um, and I have seen um, a kind of a handful of those, and those are patients you may really want to consider keeping on this medication for a long time. Um, it is off-label use in children under the age of 16, or if you're going to be using it longer than 12 weeks. Um, and it's particularly beneficial in obesity states with uncontrolled hunger or patients that just never feel full. Um, 
side effects you have to be aware of and watch for include that increased heart rate. You need to check their blood pressure, counsel them on dry mouth, sleep disturbances. Very important, this has the potential to worsen anxiety, um, as well as some irritability and constipation. Okay, so now we're going to move on to options that are um, have evidence for pediatric use but are not specifically FDA indicated for treatment of obesity. So first is metformin. Um, we kind of talked about this briefly. It is actually FDA approved for children greater than 10 with type 2 diabetes. Um, however, it does not carry any specific indication for obesity at this time. It works through activation of protein kinase pathways that ends up resulting in a decrease of hepatic glucose output. And what's interesting about metformin is it actually enhances your primary hepatic and muscle insulin sensitivity without a direct effect on your beta cell function. So especially in children who are insulin resistant, it helps make them more sensitive to insulin without pumping a bunch more insulin into their body. Um, it's not necessarily like weight loss, but more of a decreasing or weight stabilization effect, which can be really helpful for a lot of these patients and widely considered off-label, um, but frequently used in polycystic ovarian syndrome, insulin resistance, prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, antipsychotic, medication-induced weight gain, which we already talked about. And then for some people, it can also help with stress eating and emotional eating. The biggest side effects I talk about with parents is on bloating, diarrhea, and flatulence. And then the big thing you need to counsel them on is that if you're going to give them IV contrast, you need to hold the medication for 48 hours prior to a known one or for a few days after. And if you happen to be dealing with patients that have significant renal or liver disease, you really want to um, think about the increased risk of lactic acidosis and, and metformin use in those. So pyramate, which we've touched on a little bit, um, not FDA indicated specifically for obesity, but is FDA indicated in pediatrics for epilepsy greater than 2 and migraines greater than 12. And of note, combined fentanyl and topiramate extended release is approved for long-term management of obesity in adults. Um, how it works, it modulates the various neurotransmitters in the brain, widely used off-label for weight loss in adults and pediatric patients, also very helpful as an adjuvant therapy for your patients that maybe have night eating syndrome or a binge eating disorder. And then interestingly, um, in adults, it's actually quite helpful for weight regain post-bariatric surgery, and it's actually one of the first ones I will go to. It has pretty good weight loss um, with a BMI reduction of about 5% on um, 75 milligrams daily for three months. Um, you do want to talk with them about side effects. Um, cognitive dysfunction slash fatigue is kind of a big one that we want to counsel on. Um, I see it occasionally, um, not that often. Um, I see it on my higher doses than my lower. Um, kidney stones and then metabolic acidosis. A particular consideration, especially if you're dealing with adolescent females, um, is teratogenic. So these girls really need to be on some kind of birth control. Um, and really strongly counseled against pregnancy, and even to the point that I have a handful of them that we take monthly pregnancy tests um, because of that teratogenic effect. Um, you do not want to use it in patients who have an inherent inborn error of metabolism with hyperammonia and encephalopathy due to kind of increased side effects or risks. Um, uh, one that you're hopefully going to be hearing more about in the next couple of years that's currently in um, clinical trials and studies is the use of the GLP-1 receptor agonists. So two actually have pretty good evidence for pediatric use, exenatide and ligarutatide, um, and they are indicated for type 2 diabetes in adults. Um, they are currently under study for type 2 diabetes in children and adolescents. Um, specifically, ligarutatide has a separate approval for obesity treatment in adults. What's kind of novel about these agents is they act not just on the stomach and brain, but also the pancreas and liver and overall kind of create an increased feeling of fullness and reduction in after-meal blood sugar. And um, the agents like ligarutatide and then semaglutatide, which is a newer one on the market, um, actually cross the blood-brain barrier and also interact kind of on the brain level to also help with feelings of satiety and decreased drive for eating. Um, so for exenatide, you saw a BMI reduction of 3.42% at three months. Um, when it was studied uh, off-label for patients under 18 with obesity. Um, there are currently clinical trials going on for ligarutatide, um, and the initial results do um, seem to be promising. Um, side effect-wise, you want to counsel them about abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and there is a potential risk for hypoglycemia. Okay, uh, Vyvanse or Ligs, I can never say the correct name for Vyvanse, but it is FDA indicated for children greater than 6 with ADHD. And um, in adults, it can be used short-term for helping with binge eating disorder. It's a central nervous system stimulant. Who it's particularly beneficial for is if you have kind of a younger child with obesity and ADHD, 
especially if they maybe have some uncontrolled eating behavior, you may want to consider trying this one before some of the other ADHD medications. Um, weight loss, really not that impressive in either age group. Um, biggest side effects you want to think about are anorexia, anxiety, decreased appetite, dizziness, dry mouth, insomnia. Um, and then this one actually interestingly does have some animal studies that do suggest there's a potential neuroplasticity effect in the peripubertal period, um, which could negatively impact maturation of brain structures. Um, there are some cardiovascular concerns you need to be aware of, um, like any stimulant, and that includes death, blood pressure, and elevation in your heart rate. Okay, so we're going to now move into the ones that are FDA indicated for obesity, but do not have any current pediatric data. So the first one is locatherin, also known as Belweek, and this is FDA indicated for management of obesity in adults. How it works, it's a 5-HT receptor 2C agonist. Um, Off-label consideration for adolescents under 18 with obesity. Um, side effects include headache, dizziness, fatigue, dry mouth, constipation, headache, and back pain. Um, special considerations for this one are interesting. So serotonin syndrome or neuroleptic malignant-like syndromes, if you're going to co-administer it with other serotonergic or antidopaminergic agents. And then if you understand the history about where locatherin came from, um, it's kind of a relative fenfluramine, which was the agent in the old drug fenfen that caused a lot of valvular heart disease because of the, the dirtiness of the drug and its interaction on um, a variety of 5-HT receptors. And so lorcatherin is not supposed to interact on the heart valve, um, but you do want to think about that if you're choosing to use it, um, that if you start seeing signs of valvular heart disease, you immediately need to discontinue it if, it, if the patient's on the medication. Um, there is no current safety or outcome data available for pediatric patients. The next one um, would be the combination of naltrexone with bupropion SR, um, how it works. So naltrexone blocks the opiate uh, receptor-mediated POMC, um, and then bupropion being a selective inhibition of reuptake of dopamine and noradrenaline in the brain. This um, is indicated for long-term treatment of obesity in adults. There are some off-label indications. Um, bupropion has widely been used off-label in pediatrics for management of depression as well as ADHD adjuvant therapy. Um, your biggest risk that you need to consider if you're going to counsel children is on the increased risk of suicidal ideation, which is largely due to the bupropion effect. Um, if you're using both drugs together, there's a potential for uh, precipitation of seizures if there's an underlying seizure disorder, um, nausea, constipation, headache, dizziness, insomnia, dry mouth. Um, potential uncontrolled hypertension, and then if you have a patient on chronic opiate use, you would not want to use this because of the naltrexone component. And some special considerations, um, bupropion actually can worsen underlying anxiety, so while it's a great choice for depression, if you're dealing with a teenager who also has significant anxiety, this would probably not be my first go-to. Um, and then the last one I briefly want to touch on, because you'll probably hear more about it in the next few years, and it's a novel drug called setmelanotide, um, and it is pending FDA approval for rare monogenetic forms of obesity upstream of that MC4 receptor pathway that we discussed. Specifically, if you're having to deal with any of um, these types of children with either a POMC deficiency, Prader-Willi, bardet beetle Alstrom, um, this is an up-and-coming option for them. It is currently in phase three trials and has some promising results. Of course, side effect-wise, we only have some mild data right now, but it looks like dry mouth, um, some induration at the injection site, and because it works through the melanocortin pathway, there is some darkening of skin nevi. But in the adult patients that have been published in the literature, um, some of them have seen upwards of 50 kilograms over 42 weeks of weight loss. Okay, so we're going to touch briefly on the role for metabolic and bariatric surgery. Um, so this is kind of the uh, pediatric algorithm slide that summarizes the team lab study. And so who do we indicate bariatric surgery for? We kind of touched about this, but it mirrors that of the adult patients. So if a BMI greater than 40 or greater than 140% of the 95th percentile without a comorbidity, or a BMI greater than or equal to 35 with a significant comorbidity, or that 120th percentile of the 95th percentile. Um, Outcomes, um, so interesting, the team lab study, which, uh, like I said, that reference is at the front of the presentation. Overall percentage weight loss was about 27% of total um, body weight. Uh, more importantly, for those of us that do this with children, we're doing this because of the metabolic consequences, so thinking about that cardiometabolic health. 
74% who presented kind of with hypertension will have normalized their blood pressure. 66% will have gone from dyslipidemia down to our normal lipid levels. And then if they did have type 2 diabetes at the onset of the study when they had their surgery, there was greater than 50% full remission of type 2 diabetes. We always worry about complications. Um, so we are doing uh, surgery on the gut, and this is why they need lifelong following. But 57% have low ferritin levels. Um, we did cause about 8% uh, vitamin D deficiency. Um, and then 16% would develop vitamin A deficiency of interest. There's actually no change in vitamin D deficiency. Um, they're all low, whether they started in after at about 37% before and after metabolic surgery. And so kind of our current recommendations, um, we generally look at doing vertical sleeve gastrectomy, uh, which is the most common operation performed in adolescents. However, there are indications for consideration of a ruin y gastric bypass, and the overall risk-benefit profile is roughly um, similar. You have to screen heavily for micronutrient deficiencies at baseline and ongoing. And again, as we talked about, obesity is a chronic disease, so you really want to think about adjuvant pharmacology as well. And if you're dealing with a female, um, you really need to talk with her about increased fertility with weight loss. And, and I strongly advocate that the young females in our program, again, be on some kind of birth control for at least one to two years afterwards to kind of avoid um, pregnancy during that window. And then again, you need to think about getting a scent from your adolescent as well as a good conversation of informed consent with the family and guardian and document that in your chart. Okay, um, I am probably going to see if I can't go through this real quick. So this is a case study that I think kind of can tie some things together. So this is a 15-year-old female who initially presented to me to establish care for her obesity, depression, anxiety, and chronic pain. She didn't been most she had been obese most of her entire childhood. She'd previously been seen by a few different endocrinology groups and started um, on metformin for insulin resistance, although low dose. Um, not really had any significant decline in her BMI trajectory. She'd also been on several mental health medications over the last couple of years, and I've listed those there. And she is currently enrolled in therapy. And when she came to me, um, this was slowly getting better. She'd recently come out to her family as being a transgendered individual. Um, and then she also had struggled with chronic musculoskeletal pain and did fairly well with a pain psychologist in physical therapy. She had multiple missed school days to her underlying health um, issues. She had a long history of abnormal menses that was also being treated with oral contraceptives, and she had a recent abdominal ultrasound that was significant for hepatomegaly with fat infiltration. Um, Diet-wise, she thinks she eats a normal amount of food. Um, you can kind of see she's got an overall pretty poor diet quality here. And then while she tells me she thinks she eats normal portions, mom tells me that when she goes grocery shopping, um, you know, the groceries she thinks that will last one week are only really lasting two to three days. And when you further ask her about her food choices, there is actually quite a bit of uh, food insecurity um, as a barrier to kind of fruit and vegetable intake, as well as she has significant textural aversion to many fruits and vegetables. In addition to their food insecurity, the family also dealt quite a bit with housing insecurity. She was not very active, and then her family history was significant for a mom with a history of a ruin y gastric bypass 12 years prior. So in physical exam, I'd like to point out here, her weight was 435.8 pounds with a BMI of 62.53, and she also had a mildly elevated blood pressure. Um, you know, her exam did have a large acanthosis consistent with her uh, insulin resistance, and then she also had noted dyslipidemia of obesity and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Um, right off the bat, you know, one of the first discussions I had with them was potentially looking at bariatric surgery given her BMI of 62. Here is her growth chart. Um, so this is where she started with me. And so this was kind of her trajectory um, over the past two years um, for which she'd been struggling and her most recent trajectory um, prior to coming to see me. So at our first visit, we kind of um, encouraged her to do a low-carb, high-fat diet and start paying attention more to her hunger and eating patterns. And we started working on some of her food and housing insecurity. So when I saw her next, you can kind of see we're kind of bouncing around a little bit, um, but relatively about the same. Um, I started her on fentramine after reviewing her hunger curve, um, and then we started working slowly together on kind of increasing her fruit and vegetable intake through a desensitization program um, to help her understand the different textures in food. And as you can see, we're actually doing pretty well here. Um, I increased her metformin over this period of time slowly to 750 milligrams extended release twice daily. Um, she actually now eats a whole wide range of fruits and vegetables. They kind of secured a new housing. They have a garden. Um, she started um, kind of coming out of her shell. She's doing marching band, drama, works at a vet's office now. 
And actually right now, at about 50 pounds lost from her peak, um, she did get down here, I'll show you in a minute, um, is saving um, her $200 for her program fee to undergo bariatric surgery. And so she did get down here to about 398. Then we had kind of our snowmageddon this year, so she didn't exercise as much. But to date, her kind of total weight loss is about 50 pounds, and her goal right now is to try and lose enough weight so she can fit into the rides and ride the rides at Adventureland for her birthday. So she's, she's come quite a ways. Um, so that's all I have. I'm going to try and figure out how to switch this over to Dr. LaRoche, and I'll stay on in case there's any questions afterwards. Okay, Dr. LaRoche, I'm going to try to put you share your screen. All right. So I don't have a thing that says... Ah, there we go. Share my screen. Yes. Share my screen. This one. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So now I can do this, and you should be able to see it. Can everybody see it? You see my screen? Yeah. Okay, and you can hear me. So, um, so my name is um, Helena LaRoche, and I am in the Department of Internal Medicine and in Pediatrics. I'm med ped trained, just like Jennifer. Um, and I am director of the Weight Management Clinic, but I actually see adults currently. Um, uh, but um, what I do in my research life is working with families on obesity prevention and particularly low-income families, which is where all these resources come in. Um, now, Jennifer um, illustrated quite well in her, her case study that, that um, beyond um, what we can offer medically, um, there's a whole a host of things that we need to help support our families and, our, and the kids um, in terms of they need other supports, whether it is to help making lifestyle changes or to actually help other things in the home so that they can actually even focus on lifestyle changes. They can't get there. And these medications work, but they work best when they're combined with lifestyle changes. Uh, the medicines alone uh, don't work nearly as well. So um, the need for resources might be as simple as a bike or as complex as housing. And in one low-income pediatric practice, 52% of families had one or more unmet basic need. So that might be employment, that might be education, child care, food, or housing. And meeting these needs really might allow families to devote more attention to healthy behaviors that they can't do that. If you're going to pick healthy behaviors over, over rent, rent is going to win. So um, when we um, increase access to healthy foods, we know that that can impact diet behaviors and BMI. Um, for example, providing fruits and vegetables plus weekly education to um, adult African-American women, you saw a two kilogram weight loss where the control group gained another kilogram. Um, and in providing bottled water as an alternative to sweetened beverages decreased the BMI by 0.6 kilograms per meter squared in teenagers with obesity. And we've shown that discounted gym memberships have actually been shown to improve multiple indicators of fitness and cardiovascular risk factors. So one of the things that we've been doing actually is we have a randomized control trial um, that just finished up and results are forthcoming. Um, where we um, were working on a family-based intervention to promote healthy behaviors and to prevent excess weight gain in both the parents and the children. And we were focused on low-income families where a parent had a BMI of 30 or above and at least one child aged 6 to 12 years of, old, of age because having an, a parent with a, a high BMI puts these children at huge risk. Um, so we had a health coaching group that uh, we did motivational interviewing with the entire family. But the other piece that we did is that we did community resource mobilization. First, we worked on basic needs, heating and housing. And then we worked on diet and physical activity specific resources, things like recipes, community classes, parks and recreation. And then our other group did written education newsletters. And they, all, they also did the basic resources screen because we felt like that was something we should do with everybody. So you can see on the right, you will see that this is our um, 
our screening form for the basic resources. And so we looked at things like food and employment and housing and financial assistance and healthcare and family care and other things. Um, and our top referrals were to the food pantries, to financial assistance programs, and then those that were in the intervention group were focusing on physical activity and diet. Um, we really, these discount, these are in Des Moines, so the, I don't know why it's doing that, but the discount cards for parks and recreation activities were very um, helpful. So if you leave with nothing else in terms of thinking about resources, if you are in a practice where you don't have a social worker or anybody else to help you, um, 211 is a great number to give to families. And they also now have a website um, that is getting better. It's still missing some resources, but I know that they're working on it. Um, it's folk, the United Way is the, is the basic um, people running this, but they have resources ranging everywhere from housing to um, some of the food and food resources. They don't have quite as much of the activity resources, but when you got to start with the basics, this is a good place to lead people to. If you do have, if you're lucky enough to have a social worker or enough social workers, um, they can be very helpful with the basics. They are, they are probably not going to have time to, you know, to think about physical activity resources, perhaps. Um, and and some of the you know community classes for diet and things like that. Um, if you're if you're thinking about a child under five or one of the ki other kids in the home is under five, um, and you're lucky enough to have it in your county, um, those of your pediatricians know that first five is very helpful. Um, so in terms of financial assistance, you know you've got your basics for kids. You're going to talk about temporary temporary assistance for needy families, which is the Iowa version is called the Family Investment Program. Other people just call it welfare. Okay, um, WIC, which is the Supplemental Assistance for Women and Infants and Children. So again, if there's a pregnant woman, if a woman in in the household is pregnant or postpartum, or you've got a kid under five, you can get extra food for that family. And then obviously the the supplemental nutritional and assistance program or food stamps. Okay. Um, so we know that food insecurity is linked to obesity, um, and that food insecurity really impedes obesity treatment. So. You know, one of the first places that we might send pe people are to the local food pantries. Now, food pantries vary a lot in what is available. Okay, some food pantries have really focused on bringing in some healthy foods and have been able to bring in, say, like fresh fruits and vegetables or even frozen fruits and vegetables. But other pantries are really still relying on kind of those staples that come from the government, the cheese and, and grain sort of things, and donations, which may or may not be what you want in terms of healthy foods. Okay, so you may have to teach, you may have to think about talking with your uh, patients about, you know, what are the healthy options that may be available. Some food pantries allow people to choose from what's available, choose a certain amount of food, and other food pantries just hand them a box. So, but you can do things like look for the fruit, if, you, if it's canned fruits, look for the ones that are least in light syrup, not heavy syrup, and if, and if, if they're lucky enough to get the ones that are in juice. Um, and things like that, looking for the maybe higher grain cereals rather than the junk cereals. The same things you might tell them in a grocery store, but in the food pantries, they're kind of stuck with what's there. Okay. Um, the free and reduced um, lunch at school is important for families that don't have a lot. They also, there's a summer food program, so they can continue to get food during the summer in a lot of places. And then we talked about WIC. In terms of SNAP, there's also another program called Double Up Food Bucks program that goes with the SNAP. And basically, if they spend $10 in SNAP at a local food farmer's market and also new Pioneer Food Co-op stores, which are located in Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, and other grocery stores are hopefully coming online. Um, so if they spend $10 on, on vegetables, then they can spend an additional, they can get an additional $10 to spend more on vegetables. So they get extra money if they spend their money on vegetables. And that's the website that, um, that I've given you there that will update you on, you know, what places are available to do that. But there are, um, there are the, I know the farmer's markets in Cedar Rapids, Decorah, Des Moines, Dubuque, Grinnell, Iowa City, and Waterloo all take these, all have this double up food bucks programs. Um, community gardens can be a great um, resource for people. Sometimes there are costs 
un involved with them, uh, so you have to check. Um, but um, when kids grow things, it's amazing, then they want to eat it. Um, and, and there are a lot of places, some of these community gardens and other community groups that will give out, you know, like little tomato plants or pepper plants that you can grow in a pot. Because a lot of these people don't have backyards, but they might have a balcony or a back stoop and they can run, they can grow um, tomatoes and uh, other vegetables in a pot. And our families in, in our um, program really love that. Um, there are a lot of web resources that are available. These are some of the ones that we really like. Um, the Iowa State Extension has a Spend Smart, Eat Smart, which is focused on getting healthy people to eat healthier foods and that are low cost. Um, if you're really focusing on trying to get rid of sugar um, in some of your obesity treatment, you will note that some of their recipes have higher sugar content. The reason is, is because they're kind of trying to get people used to fruits and vegetables and trying to move them towards these healthier foods. So they don't want to cut it. They, they haven't done things like cut out the sugar entirely. Um, so um, Ellen Satter is, um, does a lot of stuff on how to feed kids. Um, you know, that's where the you provide, they decide has come from. That's one of the places it's come from. And so she did, there's a nice site there. There's a lot of information on how to look, how to teach kids to eat healthier. Um, you know, the USDA has a SNAP Ed program um, website. And um, if you were, and when we're looking for more specific um, things targeted towards certain communities, the NIH has a bunch of Latino heart healthy Latino recipes. Um, they also have a, 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 a brochure on um, healthy, heart healthy cooking for African American styles. Um, and then the USD also has this tips for mom website that's kind of fun. Um, and they have some videos on YouTube to introduce people to that. Um, in terms of physical activity, you really want to think about parks and recreation. Um, they, they are likely to have some of the most low cost activities that are available for kids. Um, some of the places have discount cards. I know Des Moines best, so I can tell you that they have a gra the graph card that people can apply for that discounts all of their activities. Um, the YMCA is also an option. Um, remember that a lot of them have discounted rates on memberships for people with lower incomes. They have to sometimes negotiate, they have to fill out this form, but, but they are available. And some of the specific YMCAs have programs that are aimed specifically at children. For example, um, the Grub YMCA in Des Moines, any child can walk into that place without their parent and give with five bucks they can get a membership that allows them to go during non-school hours only and only to the Grub Y. Um, there are local youth sports leagues. Um, an example might be kicker soccer in Iowa City that can be, if, particularly if they have volunteer staff, they can be lower cost. The Boys and Girls Club, if you have one, is wonderful. Um, um, the re, there are refurbished bikes, and sometimes you can borrow a bike from places like the bike collectives. Um, so look out for those, can be very useful. And, and you always want to get helmets. So think about uh, the Children's Hospital, for example, Blank Children's Hospital. Um, in Des Moines gives out um, helmets. Um, think about resale activity and clothing for equipment, things like um, there's a uh, play it against sports or other thrift shops that will show that will sell used equipment um, to allow kids to play sports at a lower cost. Um, and then there are a bunch of videos um, online. Um, I particularly happen to like Go Noodle and so does my son, but there are other ones. There's Let's Move, there's an NFL um, Play 60 um, uh, that could get kids um, jumping up and down and playing in their household. Um, the AP has a website. The We Can materials are nice and you can order them if you want little booklets to give your families. Um, and then there's the 5210 as well. Um, always, uh, I always think about sleep. So um, the um, Teaching our kids deep breathing exercises can be useful to help them to fall asleep. The um, Sleep Foundation has some nice materials on why kids need to sleep longer than sometimes parents realize. Um, and 
and um, you have to look under the shift, shift work disorder section, so not where you'd normally think about looking, but they have nice descriptions of relaxation exercises for falling asleep. Um, other useful referrals, you know, everything's a trade-off. So if you've got to pay money for something, there's no money for something else. And so healthy food can fall in, uh, cannot get bought because they have to spend their money on other things. And what happens every August is they've got to buy all these food school supplies. So looking for places that give out free school supplies, because there are often drives that do that, can save families money that can then be spent on healthy food. Um, community colleges often have workforce development sort of stuff to help parents with finding work and Iowa workforce development itself is useful and if you're looking for resources in your community talk to whatever your local United Way would be they they're they're by regions because they're gonna know who are the who are those organizations in your community that might be helpful um, you know there are in um, Des Moines specific, if you happen to be in Des Moines, the Evelyn K. Davis Center for Working Families is very, um, can connect families with all sorts of resources. All they have to do is go in and they get connected with all sorts of things. And remember your local churches, they do wonderful things. Um, and I think that I am at the end of my slides. Um, so I think we can open it up for questions. Yeah, we'll have another question. You can go ahead and type in the chat box and we'll have one of you answer that. Yeah. Okay, like, don't think we're going to any questions, but thank you both so much for taking the time out and presenting on these topics. And the video webinar is recorded and will be posted um, on the Adam Medical side of the YouTube website. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yes, thank you for listening.